thanks. It's uh, great to be here and a uh, couple minutes or hours um, ahead of you. Still a little jet lag, but happy to be here. So I'm here um, to ask you to think bigger about Africa, the United States, China, India, Japan, Eastern Europe as we know it, all fit within the geography of Africa. You have an economy that is expected to grow at 6% next year, uh, over 1 billion people on the most multilingual continent, the second largest mobile um, market in the world now after Asia. And there's so much more to what's happening now being captured uh, in the spirits of the 1 billion people in Africa in 55 countries, mind you. So Africa, if it's not been said already, it's not a country. Remember that. Now, maybe your timeline looks something like this, and this isn't too clear, but this is NASA's picture of the night sky. And so maybe you get the occasional retweet from somewhere far flung and a little away from you, but that needs to change, all right? And it's about time you got some Africa in your timeline, in your newsfeed, in your Google Reader, wherever you go, you better get some. Mm -hmm. Too long, didn't speak about it. Like I said, Africa, a lot happening. I could, I could bore you to tears uh, with everything, whether you're an economist, um, an activist, a campaigner. Taryn's talk yesterday about interrogating our motives and certainly how we measure, which is a theme that we heard so much during the first day. Look into it. Um, you will not regret it. So, March 2012. Uh, and this campaign happened to uh, land not only here, but certainly globally. Kony 2012. Invisible Children's Activism campaign sparked by the video and so many things we ended up learning about activism, clicktivism if you like, and lessons about um, this idea of, of, of doing good um, and how the internet changes that. Now there was a lot to be said and I'm not going to get into I guess um, the, the, the tales and intricacies of it, but one of the things, the unintended consequences of the campaign was some of the voices, the African voices which were taken now, put on the global stage, the world stage, in front of some of the largest media uh, companies around, and given an opportunity to voice the African perspective and what's happening with people on the ground in Uganda, where, where Joseph Kony um, was at this point, and certainly all across the world, Nigerian author, uh, based, based here in New York, actually in the US, talked about the white savior industrial complex of uh, supporting brutal uh, policies in the morning, founding charities in the afternoon, and receiving awards in the evening. And certainly, people like Rosebel Kagumire um, in Uganda, who spoke extensively about um, some of the criticisms of the campaign, this was something that, that hadn't been seen before, which was now both sides of the narrative being fully captured uh, in front of the global media for us to see. Teddy Rouge or TMS Rouge said, sandwiched between our historically factual imperfections and well-intentioned road to hell building do-gooders, it's a suffocating state of existence. But closer to home, Nairobi, same week as it turns out, same week in 2012, something else was taking place. And I um, was there um, covering, I guess, a number of things across the, the internet, as it were. And there happened to be a grenade explosion in one side of um, Nairobi. And this was covered on CNN, but one subtlety was missed. And instead of us being categorized as we were victims of terror at the time, it was violence in Kenya. And this sparked off a reaction for a number of reasons. 2007, 2008, there was a contested election. As a result of that, the country did go into a state of um, unrest and in some places violence, and that has plagued us. And what the international media did by riding this wave and really uncovering a lot of what was happening was it hurt tourism, it hurt the image of the country, and left the Kenyan population feeling as they watched CNN, Al Jazeera, and a lot of the media, like they had no opportunity to respond, to participate in this segment of the news. So 2012, and things had changed. Now you had Twitter, you had you know, very high levels at that. Kenya's the second uh, most active um, country um, on Twitter in Africa at the moment, at least according to what statistics, if you can trust them at all, say. Um, so someone tells CNN, you know, Africans, we, we watch it too, and certainly will not be misrepresented. And people began a trend that not only just took root within Kenya alone, but cross borders, 
and trended globally. And in fact, we had an apology from the journalist who filed the story, actually acknowledging that there was an, a problem that victims, you know, that um, certainly they, they, if it bleeds, it leads, which is a, a common newsroom term, and that they did make a mistake, but people weren't satisfied. And in 2012, at least, they got the world to notice and to join to say, someone tell CNN that there was a problem here and Kenyans wouldn't be having any of that. Now, 2013, just a couple months ago, Kenya's general election. So as I said, a March 2007 um, election meant that this one, the whole world was watching us. Uh, wasn't much fun, but certainly Kenyans online prepared for it and had a sense of anticipation about their role this time in dictating how they felt uh, about the news and the media itself. And as it would turn out, CNN, yet again, um, with a new correspondent, put out a story. All right. Now, you had journalists parachuting in from all corners of the world. Certainly, um, a, a couple, bit of war reporting never hurt anyone. And if you can find a sexy enough story about the precipice of violence, um, then you would you know, pick up some random award. I don't know. Now, in this particular case, uh, Nima al Bahra, who's here uh, with um, a man who claims to be the leader of a militia, um, who, who you know, haul around these iron pipe made homemade guns and use homemade bullets and in what looked like much of a farce was presented as a story of Kenyans uh, armed and ready to vote. Now, this bore the full wrath of KOT or Kenyans on Twitter as they're affectionately or infamously known now. And I, my goodness, I mean, it, it ended up being a peaceful election by, by many accounts and um, that led to a couple of very interesting uh, tweets here, foreign reporters clash in Kenya amidst growing scarcity of bad news. Kenya, uh, foreign journalists stranded in their hotels as peace makes it hard for them to do their job. And sub memes like tweet like a foreign journalist, right? Just finding any opportunity to use humor and this alternative African narrative to really drive that Africans have something to say and boy, should you be listening. Um, and more, moreover than that, CNN got a tidal wave of Africans all uniting behind this idea that you have been misreporting facts and certainly twisting things towards um, this African narrative and we're not going to have any of that. So you had this little image here which took fun at that gentleman before with the, with the chalk on his face and saying, okay, we had a whole section of sub-memes around CNN and their lack of um, you know, work around this. So one other little interesting thing is that while Kenyans were great at correcting, they did also miss out on some of the nuance. This was a very funny um, uh, example. Stuart Naval, uh, journalist with Franz von Kat, you know, put this out as he saw a very interesting set of uh, imagery in the newsroom. However, Kenyans weren't having any of that either. Anybody who talked bad about us was going to get the full wrath. And so people were like, you know, armed with a machete and a spoon. Someone destroys a plate of rice. You had... Uh, those of the mango origin strip naked, he was, he was peeling a mango, of course, and people went on and on, and he really, really um, was overwhelmed with a tidal wave of people who took this trend global again, so uh, not from the Kenyan trend to a global trend um, that people were all jumping in from different parts of the globe. Even um, the spokesman of the Kenyan army, Major Chir Chir, who's in and of himself a very interesting story, um, tweeting between him and Al-Shabaab about who's winning the war in Somalia, something you need to check out. But here, even he said, let Kenyans concentrate, this is a little unnecessary. So Kenyans didn't stop there. They started taking on other African countries. Botswana, after we elected our president and deputy president, were the first to come out and say, you know what, since he's indicted by the International Criminal Court, he, sh he has no business setting foot in Botswana. And Kenyans said, oh, is that right? And so the next thing they did is they found any person who was claiming to be from Botswana and they tore into them and they were just sending barbs and jabs about how small the country is, how, our GDP, you know, how their GDP can fit into very random far-flung parts of the country and really taking stabs. And what began was someone tell Botswana versus someone tell Kenya. And people were trying to find anything they could find on Kenya. You take it, you know, our affinity to your president, you know, claiming him as a son, you know, you know ruling a far, far away country, down to things about, you know, running, as you'd imagine, you know, all these long distance races. But here was just a sample of what we found. And obviously, it did need us to calm down a little bit. And a couple people tried to make sense of things, where they are members of parliament, our story that you need to see, they, they are quite something. But anyway, that aside, we took on Uganda next, when Uganda published a story in their newspaper that said, 
that our newly elected president, Uhuru Kenyatta, was actually Ugandan, which was untrue, but, um, but you know, they, they ran it anyway, and people dug into them. We went against Tanzania, but as it would happen, Nigeria was the one nobody could have prepared for, not only on the numbers themselves. Um, the actual number of people with access to the internet in Nigeria is larger than the population of Kenya itself. But nobody knew that sitting behind a, sc you know, a screen somewhere or in a cyber cafe with your phone in your hand tweeting away. And someone tell Nigeria versus someone tell Kenya was there. You have them making fun of the fact that they export a lot of culture. So USA has Hollywood, India has Bollywood, Nigeria has Nollywood at over $250 million. It's huge. Kenya, firewood, we're toast. Um, on the other hand, you had to be a president in Kenya, one needs 50 plus, you know, 50% plus one. Uh, in Nigeria, theirs is just by good luck. Good luck happens to be the name of the Nigerian president. So a lot of very underhanded jabs at, at each other. And to be honest, on the volume alone, Nigeria smashed us. But I must say, uh, because KOT are watching right now, Kenya did a valiant job, and hey, to us, we certainly did win. <laughs> now, <laughs> one of the things we learned out of this was this was actually sparked by a football game. Right? And the fact that the Nigerians didn't treat the Kenyan football team, soccer if you like, um, in the appropriate way. And this was sparked by um, a journalist at the time. And this is what sparked this, what you could call one of Africa's first Twitter wars. And this went global. These two respective trends, um, you know, you look at Transmap, you look at Twitter, they went global and it was head to head. Now, people dug into the subcultures and a lot of different things. Uh, you have a replica of the Google homepage that says enter your account number and click here to search for inheritance. You know, amongst other things, uh, just taking shots at Nigerians, them taking shots at us. But Kenyans and Kenyans on Twitter didn't seem to take the hint. And it's an interesting thing about searching for identity happens, like I said, to be a football match. And little did we know that the actual referee of the match was uh, all referees were from Botswana, so we prayed that none of them used Twitter, otherwise it would have been trouble. It was a draw, lucky for us, um, and we played a couple days ago and lost, sadly. Now, the thing about the social media scene in Kenya today is that it's characterized by this idea about hate speech and ethnicity, and people with access to technology, one of the worlds, um, certainly in, in the emerging world and in Africa, standing out and knowing their full power to turn a couple tweets and a hashtag into a tidal wave that turns CNN into a formal apology. And this last um, election, they did actually make a statement around the story, amongst other international media. And they were here um, as a collective exploring this not only uniting the continent behind this idea of confronting Western arrogance, but at the same time, even though we're borderless, even though now the African Union is exploring this idea of Pan-Africanism today, 50 years after it began um, in Addis Ababa, now you have people who are exploring ethnicity through Twitter, through Facebook, through technology. And a lot of people say, we did not fight in the streets during this election, but there was this kind of a scene as a... Um, editorial cartoonist Gado paints it. And so this is an open question. All I'm here to say is that while you are asleep or while you're awake, on the other side of uh, the Atlantic lies you know, one of the world's newly emerging superpowers and the next billion, if you like. And they are tweeting and they are correcting and they're ready to collaborate and co-create. So as long as you're involving campaigners on either side of the divide, it's about time you started to listen. Thank you.